good evening, distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Ambassador Sadus, for your nice words, even though I don't understand a word. <laughs> I don't understand Spanish. But I know uh, for sure that this always say good words about me. <laughs> All right. Uh, I am sorry that I cannot speak in Spanish yet, but I promise that I can say hello to you in Spanish in a few days. I will start today by very nice tactics. Uh, it's really uh, an honor for me to be with you here today uh, on this uh, special occasion of the activities that we celebrate the 50th anniversary of ASEAN as a group. And um, I, I feel very excited about the theme of the topic today. Uh, we talk about engaging Latin America. So when I, I was given the topic of peace and stability in the region, I was th thinking, what? Why do these two regions are connected on this issue? So um, maybe the time frame that he's given. Uh, I am given, so I would like to make three, sorry, four major points. The first point I would like to make is that peace and stability are pivotal for development and prosperity for every country, no matter where we are situated, either in Southeast Asia or in Latin America. So, and thus, all of us are the stakeholders of the maintenance of peace and stability in our separate region for our own development and prosperity. As far as ASEAN, I can't say it for you, on behalf of you, but for ASEAN, the interconnection between peace and stability and development and prosperity has been proved true throughout the history of the organization. Uh, as you may have experienced, Whenever the region enjoys more peace and stability, the steadier and faster growth rates are seen within ASEAN and in each member country. So, understanding the value of peace and stability, ASEAN has been striving to promote its political and security cooperation for decades. And I would like to emphasize this point. One of the greatest successes of ASEAN in the past 50 years is that the organization has been able to avoid conflicts, build a peaceful, stable, and cooperative environment within our organization in Southeast Asia and part of the Asia Pacific region. As such, the organization has been able to help its member states to fulfill their economic development goals and consolidate a unified and strong ASEAN against pressure from outside. On the basis of ASEAN way principles and on the basis of the most uh, important of our principles are presentation, non-interference and consensus, and also on the basis of ASEAN Charter that came into being in 2008 ASEAN has developed into a model regional organization with the establishment, but you may, be, you may not be aware, the, the establishment of ASEAN community on December the 31st, 2015. And we, this community was based, is based on three major pillars. One, ASEAN political security community, we call it APSSS, SC. Number two, ASEAN Economic Community. And number three, ASEAN Social Cultural Community. So ASEAN has actively in implemented the uh, APSC because I'm talking about peace and stability. So we, we have implemented uh, the APSC on all aspects, in including disaster response, maritime security, counter-terrorism, and transnational crime, etc. Uh, whereas traditional and non-traditional security challenges are increasing and become more and more complex in the region, ASEAN has continuously been 
promoting regional cooperation, particularly through various mechanisms and frameworks, such as ASEAN Squad. <coughs> if you are uh, uh, an expert on ASEAN, I will speak in abbreviation, sorry. ASEAN plus one, ASEAN plus three, uh, ARF, ASEAN Regional Forum, uh, ADMM plus, among the defense ministers, and the EIS, the East Asian Summit. So all these mechanisms have helped build and enhance mutual trust, cooperation for peace and security and stability in the region, as well as effectively respond to new challenges. <coughs> and I'd like to emphasize one more thing. ASEAN boasts of two fundamental tools that have greatly helped us ensure security in Southeast Asia, namely the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, we call it the TAC, in 1976, and Southeast Asia Nuclear Weapons Free Zone, Schoenfest, in 1971. My second point is that in the context of globalization, our interest, when we say our, I hear, I mean ASEAN and Latin America, are so intertwined that peace and stability of one region can be separated from the other. So, just take uh, Asia, the Pacific, as an example. Maritime transportation and traffic are becoming increasingly significant, both in global, uh, both in uh, volume and proportion. So it is estimated, you might be familiar with this number, that more than three quarters of the global trade, including that from Latin America, are shipped around the world by sea. And two thirds of that volume go through the South China Sea. That's our region. So an irresponsible act might lead to instability or conflict and disrupt this whole, this huge flow of goods in that region. As such, many economies, including Latin Americans or Argentina, will face immeasurable consequences. My third point is that, so what are the challenges for peace and stability now? And I think there are traditional, as you may know, and non-traditional challenges. Uh, I will talk first about non-traditional uh, emerging. He was saying about the non-traditional, about environmental damages, water resources, scarcity, natural disasters, climate change, epidemics, etc. Uh, and even cyber security threat, he was talking about the interconnected uh, digital. And all these challenges demand us to enhance our ability to cooperate and respond in a very timely and effective manner. I'd like to mention briefly the issue of climate change and how it can affect peace and stability in our region. Uh, it is common knowledge to all of us that climate change badly affects the management capacity of resources typically water, and may even spark internal, transitional, or inter-regional conflicts. In addition, climate change also increases the occurrence of natural disasters, potentially leading to disturbance and instability in vulnerable regions and countries. So it is very likely that at one time, food insecurity, energy crisis, and human migration might, will converge and we will face a very big challenge. So, this is a footnote. Southeast Asia is one of the most affected regions by climate change. And the impact of climate change in the South, uh, in Southeast Asia region is even more serious when most of the countries in the region are developing countries. We are all here, developing countries. Therefore, the link between poverty Economic development and climate change has never been so strong and evident. For Latin America, Latin America, I think climate change threatens food 
security division, trade easy temperature and precipitation have seriously affected agriculture here, leading to food insecurity, hurting sustainable development in your region. Um, and so I think around 3.5 million people in the Caribbean need food aid or another because of climate change. Or 1.6 million people suffer from food insecurity due to climate change. You can name Bolivia, Ecuador, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, Paraguay. They are the most seriously affected due to climate change and serious food security challenges. So that's, that's one non-traditional challenge. The other is terrorism. We are all listening to the radio, watching TV, and it has posed unprecedented challenge to peace and security in the world as a whole. So, and we noticed that 2017 is the year that terrorism spreads to Southeast Asia and grows in Latin America. So, more than ever, we have to think about our peace and stability facing this challenge. And in Southeast Asia, we are facing very high risk of terrorism and make, we are now the second most dangerous region in the world after the Middle East due to terrorism. You are not free from that. Latin America, you are known to have been a source of terrorism, terrorist germs a long time ago. And so far this front is growing and might turn the region into a nurturing sanctuary for terrorist forces, including IS and Hezbollah. So the spreading of terrorism in both regions, we think, bring an alarm to all of us. We have to think about the way and solutions to solve that. So that's why I can see the connection between the two regions dealing with this issue. And, uh, uh, for, just, as I mentioned, just one traditional challenge. That is, I would like to share with you the information of the current situation in South China Sea, where all of us are sharing. And the South China Sea issue has been, has become a regular subject for our discussion at ASEAN. And among ASEAN and many ASEAN panels, <coughs> So the issue is often highlighted in the ASEAN documents and other relevant documents within the framework of China, ASEAN dialogue, and other forums led by ASEAN, just such as EAS, I told you earlier, ARF, or ADRF, the conduct of parties in the, in, in, in the South China Sea. And ASEAN always tries its best to maintain and consolidate the common view on the issue. So uh, we here, I speak on behalf of ASEAN, we agree to underscore the importance of maintaining peace, stability, and security, and freedom of navigation and aviation in the South China Sea, and the common interest of all nations inside and outside the region. We agree to settle disputes through peaceful means, including legal and diplomacy processes on the basis of international law, including the UNCLOS 1982, mm -hmm. and with all parties re refrain, refraining from using force or threat to use force. Threat to use force. So, uh, many people talk, know about the Uche and the cow's tongue. If that becomes real, if that ridiculous claim becomes real, Vietnam will become a landlocked country, which is unacceptable to us. Okay, and the international trade routes that we talked about earlier will be hindered and will be blocked. You need permission to get into that water, part of water in the region, and so the militarizing of different rocks and small islands there 
will surely undermine and limit the freedom of navigation and trade flow if you go through this way. So uh, it might lead to conflict. And um, it's not a threat, it's just something we should be aware of. So uh, I come to my fourth, last but not least point. Why I why I'm here in Argentina and Latin America so I should care about it. This is stability. What can and should be done about this situation? So I think, um, as I said earlier, facing all of these challenges, all countries of the two regions need to cooperate because the cooperation promise to be the key to solving challenges relating to relating to climate change, terrorism, maritime security, and others that I mentioned above. That is, that is with the aim to maintain global peace, stability, and prosperity. So our intertwined mutual interest in maintaining peace and stability should be consolidated through political channel. Where we say exchange of visits, strengthening relationship framework of FEDA, if you are aware of that, Forum of South Asia and Latin American. Uh, economic, uh, economic cooperation, which is ambassador from Indonesia, we'll be talking about ASEAN, Mercosur, and people to people connectivities, both bilaterally and multilaterally. And terrorism, <coughs> in, our, in my opinion, spares no one. So we therefore need to unite on the same front to protect our people and countries. Thus, safeguarding peace and stability in our region is a common task. So, climate change, food security, water resource management, all the non traditional challenges affect us all at various degrees. So, the entire international community has been engaged in the fight against these challenges. So, we can't stand up. We here, the two regions, can't stand out from that struggle so as to contribute to the maintenance of peace and stability in our own region and the whole world. So, as I mentioned before, over the sea lanes through the South China Sea are so crucial for international transportation and trade. If the freedom of navigation and aviation is hindered, that will certainly harm global trade and subsequently that of Southeast Asia and Latin America. Of course, Asia and Argentina are included. So we need to be proactive and in order to have a common voice on the issues that have directly impact us on the maintenance of peace and stability. So uh, if, but, and I think the most important part is international law. We have to do it through diplomatic channels, through peaceful means, based on international law. If there is no international law, just the law of the then peace and stability in the region or elsewhere can't be safeguarded. In that vein, three ASEAN countries here are based here in Buenos Aires to work with all of you for close activities connectivities and cooperation between our two regions for the sake of peace, stability, development and prosperity in each of our regions, but also for global peace. Thank you very much.